This is Grow With The Bros, hosted by Ryan and Ken Parsons, founders of the Brothers That Just Do Gutters. Welcome to another episode of The Books That Built Us. We've made every mistake in the book, so you don't have to. Our time to evolve as business owners is now. Let's grow together. All right, today we're going to be talking about the book Traction, Get a Grip on Your Business by Gino Wickman. And we have a really special guest today, my mentor, Ken's mentor, Mr. Brian Altman with DBS Remodel. Welcome, Brian. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, man. Seriously, like ever since we started this, I couldn't wait to have you on. And I'm, uh, I'm so happy that you're, you're on here today. Um, big mentor of ours and really pivotal in helping us um, become who we are and become better all the time. So, a little bit about Brian, and then I'll let you kind of give a little bit about you and your company, but um, definitely the most successful remodeling company in the Hudson Valley, possibly the world. And, uh, <laughs> in LaGrange, anyway. <laughs> definitely in LaGrange. That's definite. <clears throat> um, yeah, and what's crazy is uh, we met, I think, 10 years ago. Do you, do you remember? I do. I think you were coming in for an eye appointment at our off in our office building and you stopped in with somebody uh who introduced us and it was uh, mr michael barker oh it was yeah oh good old barney yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh i gotta say that was one of the the very best introductions that i've ever had yeah it was uh uh-huh. very awesome for sure i am a little disappointed yeah. though this is uh the 17th episode of the podcast and every week i was like yeah they're definitely going to ask me come on come on and i had to wait 17 weeks to get here oh, but man. i'm here oh, we right. wanted to get it we you know <laughs> knowing how much of a perfectionist you are we were yeah, well. sure it was good and up to your standards and our producer kaylin she just said absolutely not for so long yeah. it's, um, it's been <laughs> episodes to work all the bugs out <laughs> that's right all right well then we have no excuse the bugs should be all worked out for this one looking forward to it yeah so what's, what's crazy is um, it was a BNI referral, you know? So for any of you who have been listening, BNI is a networking organization. It's, it's really pivotal in, in helping us get where we were in the Hudson Valley business and growing a local business. It's definitely amazing. And what's really neat is uh, Michael Barker worked for a Tree Company. And after years of me knowing him, he finally introduced me to you. So I should be equally upset that he didn't even, you know, pull out this, card for years but um it was pretty crazy because you had a gutter guy for many many years and we met and i don't think you thought too much of it you were very cordial and nice but you had a guy that you were happy with and you know it didn't seem like the relationship was actually gonna go very far do you remember that i do yeah and i was okay with my guy you know and there's always i guess maybe the guards always up because there's lots of people trying to bust in. Hey, I can do your business and you know, you don't need that guy anymore. And, uh, one thing that I am and I've always been, you know, in my, uh, 35 years is I've been extremely loyal and that was probably, you know, probably one of the hardest things for anybody to, uh, not that it's a great pr- privilege to work with our company, but I'm loyal to people that I've, uh, had the opportunity to work with. And I'm sure that was probably the, the barrier that was up at the time. Yeah. Well, and I think it was just busy. I remember walking into your office, like going, holy crap. Like we have so far to go to see like a mature business, professional office space. Your whole team was so nice. Like Bob and I actually thought Bob was the owner for like a year. So sorry. <laughs> That's I, good. I talk, you know, I was doing talking to right. the wrong guy. No. <laughs> um, and then even Jen and just the, the, the atmosphere, the friendliness. And I remember walking i forget what part of your office um but you had all these awards remodeling 500 big 50 and i'm just like oh my gosh like the the amount uh i was just so impressed and i know ken was equally impressed but to see what you've accomplished in your remodeling company and just that that maturity in business uh, i don't know how else to to say it was just like you had it so dialed in Um, and it was really neat that we kept kind of running into each other, but it was, I feel like it was a good year before you started to refer us. And then maybe almost two years before you started to just use us exclusively because it just made sense for us to, uh, we were becoming friends and, um, 
And I think it just made sense for us to do business. Yeah, for sure. And I, and I think the icing on the cake was, was absolutely uh, BNI. You know, and once we got the opportunity to really to get in there, you know, and that was your thing, you know, Ryan, you're a, you're a BNI. We thought you were going to be a, a BNI lifer. And uh, Ken and I finally got you, you know, got That's you out what of I thought it was, is that you finally got to meet me, the other brother, and that was the icing on the cake. I think that, that really was it, yeah. And, uh, but at BNI, that's when we started to, I think, just learn more about each other and about our, our companies. Um, and it was the companies first, and then we started learning about our personalities and that we really, you know, uh, I think gelled, uh, you know, really well together. But we started to appreciate that boy this is like this company is like mine you know they're they're passionate they're always wanting to improve you know stuff like that and that just uh i think from day one kind of fired me up and you know you can say that you came into the office here and you noticed wow they got this going on and that going on but it was equally just uh for me on the other side it's like these guys are really progressive i want to uh pay attention a little bit more and and that got us kicked off to, you know, what's been, uh, in my opinion, just a, you know, an amazing relationship. And I tell you guys all the time, you know, that, uh, and I think it's friendships even before business that it's yeah. that special, but, uh, but B and I was, I think what really had us come together and say, Hey, we're going to, we got to, uh, pay attention to this. I think we're going to be spending some more time together. Yeah, for sure. So why don't you tell us uh, a little bit about DBS for model? What do you guys do? How long you been doing it? Well, oh boy, how long we've been doing it? 35 years. This is my 35th year in business. Um, and it's been a, a, just a, I think, a spectacular run. Spectacular meaning that just I, I love what I do and I love every day what I do. And I'm super, you know, passionate about it. And I just got lucky in life that I found something. I went to college, you know, for phys ed and a minor in business. And I had tools and a truck up at school. And I couldn't wait to get out of school and start this business. And so, you know, we've had uh, just amazing employees over the years. It's certainly the foundation of this company is built around the people that have served here and wouldn't be anywhere with, without them. And I do give them, you know, all of the credit. Um, but today we are a, uh, you know, a little much different. We started as a deck building company called Duchess Decking and within about five years, we were still doing the decks, sunroom, screen enclosures, but a lot of clients were saying, hey, can you build my kitchen for me or do a bathroom? You know, I had a great experience with your company. And I was like, yeah, sure, that sounds great. And certainly the name Duchess Decking didn't lend towards everything. So we changed the name to Duchess Building Specialists and then it got shortened to DBS and we added the remodel. But these days we're a... Uh, a design build remodeling company. We focus, I would say, mainly on kitchens and baths uh, in, a, in addition to maybe finished basements, so that type of work. But we'll do every phase of residential remodeling. Um, we have 16 full-time employees uh, in the company. Uh, our average tenure is a bit over 14 years. So that, wow. you know, I, I mentioned in the beginning, uh, loyalty and yeah. I've been very loyal to those that work for me and they certainly have been so loyal in return. And that's really the energy of this company. It's the heart and soul of this company. Um, so we're, a, yeah, a thriving design build remodeling company in LaGrange, New York and uh, uh, loving what we do. Nice. Incredible. And also a national speaker. You speak at all the remodeling events. You're the most well-attended seminar of anybody there. I've attended it many times. Like what you do and the level of uh, professionalism you bring to the remodeling industry is just unparalleled uh, to see these guys sitting in your class, taking pages of notes that have been doing it for 10, 20 years that when they hear you speak and, and what you can add to the customer experience is just incredible. So. Well, I, I appreciate that. And you know, the first thing I tell anybody is look, I don't have all the answers but I'm pretty much uh, self-taught to a large degree. And I've just, you know, I've been to the school of hard knocks and I, and I, and I do love to teach. I love to educate. And I think that's what helps us be successful here um, with, with myself or anyone else, Bob, Michelle, that does the consulting. We are educators 
first. Yeah. So we educate uh, our prospects when we're out there. Love talking about that. Um, I do enjoy speaking at the at the conventions um, because uh, I just feel like we have a lot to offer, and it's not stuff that I've created; it's stuff that this company has created. Um, so we love that. And then just one more note on teaching. I mean, I really, yeah, I love doing these seminars that we do for homeowners throughout the Hudson Valley, and you know, I get to partner with some amazing local uh, vendors that we work with to try to share knowledge with homeowners and teach them how to buy remodeling and it's so difficult to do it's an intimidating process and some people never remodel because they just don't know the path they don't know how to navigate through it they have no confidence and it's really it's fun to try to uh, instill faith in people that you know there's hope out there there are some good companies and um, you know you just got to sift through and here's some important things to look for so yeah love the education part of it for sure for sure and that's so crazy to me that you were self-taught because I remember, you know, Ken and I are big on books. Ken, you know, got me to start reading books. And I remember asking you things. And I would have thought you read every business book under the sun, the way you run your business. And I was really surprised that you weren't like this huge reader. You're big on education and, and knowledge on your industry. But what you have done and figured out yourself was incredible. But for some reason... Um, I don't know if I recommended the book Traction to you or what, but you read this and you've read it at least three times, I think, right? Yeah, I, I definitely have. And it's been a, a great book. And when I say I was self-taught, I will say that my mom taught me so much, you know, and I think what she taught me was how to communicate with people and how to, you know, just see other people's perspective and point of view. And that's such a big part of business that most people don't get and they don't appreciate. And it's like a, a soft talent that not a lot of people either possess or think that it's important to possess. Uh, and, and I think once I had that, that, would, that really helped me, you know, with, with every part of it. But Traction, yeah, uh, great book. It's just, you know, it's, it's a, a roadmap that I didn't have. You know, I was running through a maze and this gave me kind of a roadmap and something where I can, if I do read it a couple of times, okay, I can follow this and you learn a little bit more each time, but a uh, great book. Very cool. So let's hop right into the book. Um, you know, there's a few things that they discuss that these are the common problems that every business owner <laughs> faces and we'll, we'll kind of discuss each one. Lack of control so they, there, there's five, lack of control, people problems, money, hitting the ceiling, and nothing works. Ken, you remember ever having any kind of lack of control in, in, in the business? I think there was a lack of control since day one uh, when I started this thing. Um, <laughs> you, know, I, you know, I had really good control when it came to working really hard and getting work done, but when it came to being a people person and all those soft skills, uh, that was definitely not me. I, I've definitely had to learn a lot over the years about getting control over other aspects of the business. And certainly that's definitely happened kind of like what Brian was saying that this, uh, this brothers just gutters has been built on great people and great talent that we have been able to have join uh, the vision of, of our company and uh, certainly has definitely uh, made things go into more of a controlled environment for sure since we started yeah now when you have a lack of control i feel like when when you don't if, if if you're wondering if you have control you'll know because you can't take a day off if you can't take a day mm -hmm. off you have a lack of control that means you're probably trying to control too much yourself and things happen to you that's what i figured out like if things just keep popping up and happening and i and i'm reactive all the time then i don't have control if there's no time to be proactive um, and do like the cool things that you want to do in your business, then I really feel like there's a lack of control. Um, yeah. yeah I, I also think, uh, Ryan, you know, when you're, when you're absorbing all of the issues in the company, that's when you have lack of control. You know, it's just so difficult and you're taking care of everything and trying to be everything to everybody in the company um, it's just, uh, that's when things are out of control. And I think one of the things with me is I've always been a people pleaser, which has always guaranteed our clients that we're going to do a great job because I don't want to disappoint them. But I also never wanted to, to disappoint employees too. 
And that's not a good place to be, you know, and I had a little bit of lack of control because I was trying to let everybody do what they wanted. And I was just trying to make them happy. And that was coming at my expense. And that was uh, super uh, detrimental too. So uh, gaining control was creating some accountability for sure and uh, not letting people just do whatever they want to do. Wow. That's awesome. So that kind of leads into the second one. So lack of control is one thing. And then, then people problems. What, what are some people problems? Uh, people that are always wanting more money, people that are jealous that other people are doing uh, things that they should be doing, or how come he gets to do that? Uh, it's, I mean, you can have lots of problems, you know, with that people that aren't fitting into your uh, core values right? And they're not, you're not able to check every box with, with them, uh, getting buy-in from your employees that why, why do we have to be so clean? Or why do we have to be so friendly? I don't get it. I'm doing a great job here. You know, my work is beautiful and they're, they're not getting the big picture. Uh, so with us, you know, a big problem would be if they're not adhering to our three uniques, cleanliness, politeness, and trust. You know, and if they're not on board with all of that, that's, that's a problem. It's a big problem because that's uh, our brand. It's what we've promised. And if we can't execute that, that's certainly a problem. And that's if you great. keep people like that or those problems lingering around, that could be detrimental to the company culture too, right? 100%. You know, having, uh, you know, the right people uh, in there is, is so important. And certainly the book talks about that and we can get into that. Um, but yeah, if we're, you know, we're trying to keep people either because we're desperate. I always say, you know, never hire because you're desperate. You know, if you have to fire, okay. But hiring, boy, you've really got to, I've learned you got to really look long and hard at that. But um, yeah, well, with an average tenure of 14 years, you definitely take hiring seriously. And, and we've heard a quote before, nobody's good at hiring, get good at firing. But you know what, if you take the time, and, and do it right. And I love that cleanliness, when cleanliness, politeness, and trust matter, as much as that's what your clients have telling you what's mattered, it has to matter to your people. That's your litmus test. If it doesn't matter to them, then we don't have a basis to do business. Do you feel, right. that, do you feel that now after having, you have a, a, bit, a bigger company now than when you probably started, you're at 60 employees. Do you feel that it's easier to make those kind of decisions now uh, having more depth and uh, people in your business than maybe when in past in the past when you were a little bit smaller. Sure, uh, Ken. I think you're going to stick out like a sore thumb now if you're not bringing all of that to the table. You know, there's going to be other people that are going to be offended by that. You know, and that's because of this buy-in that we've gotten, this control that we've taken back. You know, we're talking about lack of control, but if you have control, then you can control that. You have buy-in, you have everybody kind of abiding by that. So if somebody comes in and all of a sudden, you know, they're making a mess, they're not greeting the client, they're not saying, hey, thank you for the privilege to be here, you know, all of those things, uh, you're going to stick out and you're not going to last long. That's great. Yeah. Drama. Oh, people's commitment, yeah. drama, just starting their little, you know, <laughs> hey, you know, they're not doing that. Or, you know, you should be getting more. They're asking <laughs> you to do stuff outside your role, like just the freaking drama, right? Yeah. And we have to coach them. It's incumbent upon us. So we're the coaches. We got to tell them why all this stuff is important. And a yeah. good coach is going to share with them, look, this is what's in it for you. Because why would I do that? Why do I have to go out of my way and keep this job site so clean? It's like, look, this is where your raise is coming from, okay? If we can be clean all the time and we can fulfill that promise and that can be our brand, that's where the next raise is coming from. That's where the extra vacation day is coming from. Mm. So we have to make those connections for people and have them know and see bigger picture um, of that. So, so a bigger, very important. Bigger, uh, a bigger uh, point also to make based on what you said earlier about education, it's not only our responsibility to educate our customers, but it's also our responsibility as business owners if we want to have a great company to educate our employees as well. Big time. Great point. Uh, it, it really is. And it's up to us to do that. You know, and that's leadership uh, next level uh, doing that. And early on, you don't have those tools in your pouch, you know, and you're just thinking about getting the job done. Where am I going to get the material? Where am I going to get the help? And I'm dealing with the weather and a bad client or whatever. 
but then that next level is teaching them, you know, what's in it for them and being a great coach for them. And that's a big part. And I don't want to jump ahead, but yeah, coaching is just monumental as you're trying to proceed through traction and trying to, you know, inch your company forward and scale, get to the next level. Yeah. Coaching isn't there. It's not going to happen. And it can't happen with just one person, you know, the person mm -hmm. who's running the company, this, you know, the secret sauce that we have talked about too is, is making sure that we have other, imagine if we had other coaches in our company mm -hmm. that were coaching others. That's powerful. That's traction. It's huge. And I think, you know, the people problems, if, if you think we're hiring perfect people, we're not. It's not about, you have to be a coach because everyone's going to fall into some drama. Everyone's going to have some poor performance days. Some people are going to hit a ceiling that you have to help them push through. It's not about you have this all-star team from day one. It's about how do you get the best and most out of people, correct? Yeah. And you're, and it's something that we're going to always work on because they're yeah. never going to be perfect. I mean, I always picture like a baseball team, you know, these guys, if they can uh, hit the ball, get a hit one out of every three times, they're going to the hall of fame. You're not always going to do it. And there's uh, people that are just going to have different problems all, all the time. And it's like, you don't discard that employee because of this problem. First, we want to try to work with it. We want to understand, we want to be compassionate. And then we just got to get them to hopefully rise up above that and uh you know just help them through um but yeah. yeah it can be tough and it's it's not something that most uh contractors let's say just even in our world are signing up for when you're right when you go ken when you went and started your business you weren't thinking oh i'm going to be a really good coach to my to my guys you were all about hanging gutters and you could how much can we hang in a day and just you know get it done and try to keep up with it and, yeah and you were, like, uh zero business acumen <laughs> yeah and you didn't it's not even it <laughs> it's not even what you signed up for it's like you know i don't want to uh lead other people i don't want to motivate them i don't want to do sales or estimating i just want to go out and do the work you know that's the that is a problem that i see in our industry and a lot of those people they'd be better off coming to work for you or myself yeah you know who, who you don't know, want they, yeah i used to say why aren't these guys motivated like i am <laughs> and, and most people just don't, I don't think that they enjoy that part of it. And it's nothing uh, good or bad about it. Nothing to be looked down upon, but some people enjoy the craft, but then there's others who really need to be coaches and leaders running these teams. Otherwise, you know, and that's why the failure rate's so high in our industry. That's why there's so many complaints about the uh, performance, you know, of, of contractors uh, because they don't either don't have the tools or they don't like that aspect of it. But and, yeah. and it, when that comes to fruition, they should probably rethink it and maybe go work for a company so they don't have to deal with it. Yep. Right. And so uh, with that said, Brian's always hiring lead carpenters. Anybody <laughs> who uh, where cleanliness, politeness, and trust matter, he has a home for you. Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So the next one is money, money problems. Uh, we'll spend a little bit of time here. But you know what? This actually makes me mad about you, Brian. I remember clear as day, Ken and I, we were, we were in a struggle spot. Things were looking good from the outside, but the money was tight on the inside. And I, you know, call up my mentor. We might've been out to lunch. I'm like, tell me about a time that you had money problems and you, you know, might've been, he sits there and he thinks he's like, I don't know. The business has pretty much always been profitable. I think day one, I figured out how to make the right margin. And I got up and I left. No, I didn't. But I'm like, <laughs> man, how has he been able to always run a financially successful company? Like it blew my mind. So I don't know if you remember that, but I was, I was looking for a little bit of a shoulder to cry on and you didn't yeah. have it that day. <laughs> I couldn't. No, and it's, it's funny that you say that. So, you know, I've got a couple of notes in front of me, right? So <laughs> I'll put this for you here. Look at the number three is money. Look what I did. You crossed it off because it's never been an issue. Yeah, exactly. It really happened. I mean, I, I've been, again, so blessed. But I would say 35 years in business, this company has been profitable since day one. Um, every year, every single year, I've never lost money. I've never had struggles with it. Um, I didn't go through this pandemic and be like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? Because we've just always, now it's partly just because of habits of saving and being super diligent, you know, just making sure 
I'm very disciplined. And in the early years, I didn't make money because I was reading books like Traction. I made money because I was willing to work 80 hours a week mm -hmm. and, and always do the right thing, never burn bridges, take care of people, go into their home and treat them like my, the way my mother taught me to treat people. So all of that took care of itself. And I did have the, I think, the, uh, the good fortune of always um, being, I think, a, a very good boss. You know, I think that I've always treated everybody that's ever worked in this company. I've had some great people who have helped us get along the way that don't even work here anymore that I still thank to this day that have gotten us where we are. And it's been treating all of them with respect, with dignity, um, with compassion, with flexibility, all of those things, those were really large. And how did you do this? And it was, I think, the way that I treated those employees and those clients um, that we made money. Now, I didn't know how I did it. And I, I kind of wung it lots of times, but it's, it, it has not been uh, an issue for me, but uh, yeah, so I've been, I've been lucky in that respect. So I can't help you on this topic. <laughs> so for all the other humans listening to this, you know, <laughs> a lot of the time, the money problems start from not charging enough. You know, you don't have enough left over. You don't have the right people that have the same value. So they're wasting material or things. And what it leads to is you can't buy or do the things you want. You know, you have this vision and again, we'll get into that a little bit later, how it, it shouldn't just live in your head. You need to share it. But you've got this vision for what you want your business to be when it grows up. But money is a lot of time is what it's stopping us from buying that extra truck or machine or that software or that person that we actually should pay more for. We keep hiring people and saying, I can only afford X amount per hour. It really, it holds the reins back. And Ken does a great job of explaining that like, you know, your business as a horse. And a lot of times it's like this wild Mustang that just wants to run, but we're continually pulling it back because we don't have the money or we don't have the leadership or we don't have something. Yeah. But at the same time, Ryan, we have to be willing. And I guess this is one thing that I've been able to do. I've been willing to recognize that there are times when you absolutely have to spend that money. And that's the only way you're going to make money is by spending money. Yep. You know, and I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. Like Bob, when he came to this company, I didn't know what he was going to do. I just said, dude, I don't know what you're doing, but I won't even know what I did without you. And I didn't even know if I had the money to do it, but I said, I, I know that I, to get to the next level, I'm going to need to bring somebody in. And it was intimidating. It's like, wow, that's going to be expensive. It was the best money that I ever spent. And one thing that I have learned throughout the years, what's gotten me here was my ability my willingness to spend money back into the business, you know, whether it was building the shop or hiring the first guy. I remember when I hired uh, Pete who works here, boy, and he had his own business and he was telling me what it was going to cost me to uh, have him come to this company. I thought, Oh my gosh, how can I afford to spend that? It's how can you afford not to do that? And that's what for all your listeners out there. I mean, that's what's really so critical and important. I've seen so many businesses held back and not able to move forward, not able to scale or make their vision a reality because they're too chicken to invest the money. Now, we got to do it wisely. We can't just spread it out there. It's got to be calculated, but you got to be willing to spend money to make money in this business. And what I hear you saying in there too is that it's not just on tools and equipment and things of that nature. We also have to look at people as an asset to the company as well. And we got to be willing to spend uh, that money on them to get to the next level because truly what really creates freedom uh, financially and money not being an issue is being able to share the burden and the load with other people in, in leadership positions within your company. Um, and also, uh, you know, value, you know, value, what are we providing as value? You know, if you're going in there just as a, a as a price-based company where it's okay, I'll, you know, I, you want to just get this job to keep your guys busy and you have a certain kind of mindset of how you go on in business. And you certainly probably see this with some of the competitors in your market, just like we do in ours that, you know, they're, they're feeding on the bottom. Um, and the reason why they are is because they're not have a value uh, driven company to be able to provide this awesome experience for people and that's why money uh, can be a problem too, don't you think? And I, I couldn't have said that any better. You can just roll back the tape, your listeners, and just play that over again. And uh, you have to invest in the people more than anything else. And then the second part, 
about investing in those clients and what you're giving them, the value that they're giving them. You know, some people are holding back, oh my gosh, I can't afford to do this for them. I can't afford to give them some cutlery when the job's done as a parting gift or this or that. That's where, that's where you're making the money when you're doing all of those things. So uh, you're right, investing in the people and then delivering that great experience. Uh, couldn't have said it better. All right, great. So then the fourth one is hitting the ceiling and then the fifth, nothing works. So real quick, what does hitting the ceiling look like in a business? Um, for us, it was, I remember early on, I remember I tried to get some financing from a company called Green Tree Financing. And I called them up and I say, and we were probably doing about 600,000 uh, in revenue at the time. And they were like, oh, yeah, we'd love to work with your company. Uh, call us back when you get to a million. And I was like, I hung up the phone. This is when I first hired Bob. And I was, he said, hey, how'd it go? I said, dude, we got to do a million in business before we can do that. I'm like, I'm already working 75 hours. I don't understand. How could anybody even get to a million? And what I couldn't see back then was the big picture. It's that you can't do it alone. You know, you know, you need to do it with a team. You can't do a million, but if you have a team, you can do it. And that was uh, my, that was one of the first kind of ceilings that I hit. It's like, man, I can't get to that next level. I was thinking I would just have to work a hundred hours to do it. And that wasn't the answer. Wow. Don't you think that hitting a million is such a huge benchmark for somebody to hit, especially if somebody's goal is to, you know, if you're trying to get traction in your business and trying to grow it, I mean, I believe that, you know, that's where business starts is at a million, right? Yeah, I think so. Because, uh, you know, less than that, it is the Wild West and you can sling it, you know, and you're not, I guess you're kind of a company and you're putting some stuff together. But we weren't really a bona fide business. Yeah, probably until we, you know, hit maybe 1.5 or so and started to pay attention. Still didn't do any, you know, many of the things uh, that are suggested and offered in traction, but, um, but hitting that kind of revenue allows you to be able to do what you said. And, and that's to recruit people like Bob onto your team, because it gives you that revenue to be able to put people on salary that may have those kind of qualities that you're looking for to grow. Right. Yeah. But it's just hard to get to that point. People are like, well, how can I get to that point where I can hire those people? And for me, I wasn't smart enough to do it any other way other than to say, I guess I'll just work 80 hours a week. And I was able to tough it out. And I did have a lot of grit and was able to get over a bunch of those humps, save enough money in order to then behave more like a business and spend some of that money to do that. But it's hard to even just get there in the, in the first place. Yeah. And I think there's, there's ceilings the entire time. The first ceiling is, you know, owner operator doing decks by yourself getting a couple people just to get to the $600,000 mark. You had to break a lot of ceilings to get to the 1.5, the three, the four, the 5 million. We're always going to hit a ceiling and then it's our job as leaders to, to figure out how to get through it. Correct. For sure. You know, and I think at some point you have to ask yourself, what is it that you're looking for? How far do we want to go with this? You know, and does everybody on the bus want to go for that ride too? So you got to yep. do a little soul searching, I think at different points and just find out what kind of monster am I looking to create? Yep. And I think some people probably wish they could turn back time and make it simpler. So if you're making it bigger, but it's mean that you're having more responsibilities and your margins are even less. Why would we do it? Yeah. You know, who wants to be 10 million and you're making a 4% profit? I'd rather make five. I'd rather have five in revenue, you know, and have a 12% net. Yeah. Um, and that's so much come down to probably another completely different podcast. Like what's the right size for your business? And, and not all growth is revenue growth. Um, well, we're going to talk about that a little bit later too, under data. Sure. Yeah. Data True. Great. Bit. Yeah. So then the last thing, so it's nothing works. And basically, you know, you feel like you're trying everything and nothing's sticking. You've hired different people. You've tried doing meetings. You've tried not doing meetings and you just feel like you're, you're stuck. Yeah. And to me, you know what? I don't know that I can speak too much to that. It probably would have been another one that I might've drawn a line through because things, they, they did work. Um, just thousands of satisfied clients, uh, great employees working here, profitable business, um, everything I think that I wanted, 
you know, other than what I have now, which is maybe through traction and a little bit more peace and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but there's some things that, you know, didn't work. I think it's in that hitting the ceiling, those two would go together. It's like, boy, I'm trying things, but I was, I think, more doing the same things over and over again and trying to expect a different result. You know, that definition of insanity um, where I really wasn't doing things differently. It might have been a little bit different approach, but it was the same thing, the same action that delivered the same results were like, oh, you're just going to stay at this, at this revenue. Yeah. So, so yeah. now do you remember like um, why you picked up the book or what you were, your business was and like, you know, what, what were you hoping to get out of it maybe? Um, I, I think I was looking for a little bit of a roadmap, but the only reason I picked up the book is because the brothers said to pick up the book. <laughs> I wasn't picking it up. You know, I mean, you guys are the ones that read the books. I don't do that. You know, it's just, uh, I don't have time for it. I don't, I didn't really like, you know, uh, any type of reading. I'd rather just go out and do stuff, but you guys had mentioned it. And, and, uh, there's so much that I envy about you guys. And I thought, Hey, if they're reading it and it's good for them, you know, let me give it a shot. And I know that you had said there that there was a lot of stuff on, on, on meetings and running effective meetings. And that kind of, that caught, caught my attention for sure. Yeah. Same for me. The, it was just, it just kept, when you start going to seminars and reading books and, and hearing coaching, it's funny how like, most people that you listen to will mention three to five books willy nilly during a seminar. Oh, when I was reading this book, you know, and you kind of start writing it down and this book traction just kept coming up. And, uh, same reason why we read it. And, uh, for me, it was when I heard about a level 10 meeting, I heard it described this level 10 meeting. I'm like, what the heck is that? And it came from the book traction. That was the, basically the only reason I, I picked it up was to find out about that. Um, so you know, really cool. Yeah. And you were saying, yeah, we had, uh, you know, had our level 10 meetings today. And I'm like, what? I said, what the heck is that? I need a level 10 meeting, you know, and that's what would happen. And that's been our relationship. You know, you just, uh, there's so many things you guys, cause you guys are ahead of the darn game so much, very progressive. And it's like, I don't even, I don't even know about this stuff. And he knows <laughs> always like the next level or both of you do. So uh, that was my inspiration for grabbing the book. Nice. Well, we're currently doing level 11 meetings. So you're going to have to, <laughs> you know, so. we, we just had a level 15 early this morning. So oh, I'm ahead God. of you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so let's get into like the bulk of the bit, the, the, the book here. And he uses the entrepreneurial operating system, the six key areas that a business needs for optimizing. So you've got, Vision, people, data, issues, process, and that all gives you traction. So vision being definitely the biggest and the foundation for anything. Do you guys want to discuss, you know, vision and what that actually looks like in a business? Well, I, I mean, I never, early on, I didn't really have it. You know, the vision was just wake up, go out, make people happy, do this. And I never really thought much about um, where I wanted to go. I was really content with everything we were doing, we're always busy, always had work, um, but I didn't really have a vision for the future. And, you know, I was doing some uh, performance reviews, you know, that I do annually for all of my guys. And uh, Shane was asking me, one of the questions is, do you have any concerns, you know, moving forward with the company? Anything we think we should address? And he said to me, he said, you know, the only thing that I'm worried about is that I'm going to outlast you in this company. You know, he might have another 20 years left in his career. And he was worried, hey, maybe Brian's going to fold up shop next week or next month or next year. Hmm. And I was really concerned. I mean, that hit home so hard. That made me pick traction up and read it again because it's wow. continuously about, um, about vision and where's the company going to be in, in uh, you know, one year uh, in three years and even in 10 years. And I really, I, I desperately felt at that point, you know, I owe this going back to that loyalty thing. I owe this to the people that work in this company. Um, they need to know that this business is, is going to keep going. Mm -hmm. And, but what's my plan? How am I going to get there? So that really awakened me and uh, put me on high alert that vision is very important. Something that I didn't have probably the first, you know, 30 years. Uh, just Crazy. being successful without it. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I, I've noticed that our, our, a lot of the employees can't see what had already happened before they got there. When, when we talk about Ken and I and our story of Ken with a truck that he bought for 500 bucks and operating out of a barn with no electricity on my mom's property to like the office and space we have now with a franchise that's national, you know, 30, 40 employees, like a call center, like all this opportunity. It's amazing that we can have somebody say, yeah, I just, I just don't see where I'm going to be in a, in a year. And I'm like, are you kidding? But then it comes back to us. It's like you can never stop talking about your vision and putting it in front of the people as much as they can only see that day one, they're walking into a beautiful office. Day one, they see however many people. And for them, they can't really picture what's the next step for them. And, and that to me hits me all the time. You know, they don't have that uh, in their, in their memory. They haven't been here for 20 years, like a few of us. So the vision is big because most of the time it just, it is in our own head as an owner. Um, and we might share little things like, you know, hey, man, if we can do more work, we can make more money. But what's the grand vision? And um, in there are kind of where we start kind of peeling back the onion. What are our core values? What are the things that we need to do, the big rocks in the next 90 days to get a little bit closer? What is our three and 10 year target? Those are the questions that you ask yourself when you're crafting a vision so that you can force yourself to put your stuff on paper but it's only as good as how, how, and how, how you share it and how often you share it. Yeah. And I like how it, it, the book is really encouraging you. You need to share this stuff. And when you talk about core values, you know, it's a great exercise that you go through with your leadership team and say, Hey, pick three people that you really want to emulate that you respect in this business and write down five or six really strong characteristics of those people. And then we're going to sit together in a room and we're going to take all those characteristics and we're going to melt this down into our five or six core values. And they're real. They're not made up. It's not like, oh yeah, let's say we stand for trust or this. It's coming from within and every company has their core values, whether they want to identify them or not, or whether they like them or not. But I love that part of the book um, and just to identify your core values. And I love the fact that then when you're trying to figure out your people, you have to be able to check every box for those people. You know, they have that, uh, the people analyzer. Yep. Right. And if you can't check every box for that person, you probably have, you know, you, you know, you don't have the right people, the right person right there. And I, I love that part of it. And I love the going to your core values and digging out what they are. And I was like super proud of what our core values are and how that developed. I thought it was a great, uh, um, thing for our company to go through. So a lot of people think that core values is just a bunch of, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, but to get it from being blah, 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 and to being something that's meaningful in your organization is that you want to probably hire people that uh, have those, those core values, but not just hire them because they have those core values, but intertwine those into your operating system uh, within your business. Uh, and, and that accountability and communication needs to uh, flow through these meetings and the communication style that you set up or system you set up uh, for, for teaching that in your organization in order to be successful. Yeah, for sure. And I, I like, uh, like with every one of our, you know, level 10 meetings, we're going to, uh, every person uh, is given one of our core values and they um, in that meeting have to talk a little bit about what that means to them, whether it's passion, integrity, growth oriented, family, thoughtfulness, discipline, you know, they're going to be assigned one of those and they just got to share, you know, for maybe 30 seconds on that. So again, if for us to have core values, okay, that's great. And if we just keep them with our leadership team and tuck them away and maybe the marketing gets them, it's not going to do anything. Um, all of this stuff that we're coming up with needs to be shared with everybody. And that does hold everybody accountable too, if they know yeah. what, what these are. And it helps everyone internalize it. It's one thing to have them written on a wall, but it's another thing to internalize. I love that you incorporate it into everything. So it keeps it front and center. So good. For sure. So that kind of leads us right to the next one. So the vision, the people, and I love the, the whole right people in the right seats. You know, sometimes, I mean, like you just explained it earlier, you got the right person, Bob, you just had no idea what seat <laughs> on that bus and your bus wasn't even big. You had the, enough room for the driver and maybe a passenger at that point. But now, you know, your, your bus is expanded. So right per, people in the right seats. 
Yeah, and I think a lot of that, you know, the right people, I think it's pretty easy. You know, know what your core values are. And then when you're interviewing, when you're talking about this, they got to fit every one of these boxes. Or you have somebody here for 15 years. You got to make sure that they still fit every one of those boxes. It's never going to be perfect. And you might notice one that's like, you know what, in growth oriented, and that's maybe one that we struggle with with a couple of individuals here, you know, just encouraging them that we got to go to the next step with that. So if it's not right on the mark, at least we, we, we know what it is and we can help coach to try to uh, bring that along. And then the, you know, the, the right seats. Um, I do like how the book, you know, it really talks about finding everybody's uh, what they call unique ability, you know, and what's good with them. So their unique ability might not be front and center working with people. So then they shouldn't be the one answering the phone. Maybe they're really good with numbers, yep. you know, and they should be behind the scenes. So that is important. Yeah. Uh, right people, right seats. Uh, I'm all for it too. And for us, they also need to, understand our three uniques and that's got to be a big part of uh what they exemplify when they're working with all of our clients well, speaking, sure. of, speaking of seats is that one of the qualifying things when you interview somebody do you go out to their car and check out what's in their seats to see if it's not clean because that's well, one of your four values <laughs> well that's a good thing right you can just uh, lots of people have said that just open up the back of somebody's van you know and it can it can tell you an awful lot about what's going on with those yeah, people. Oh yeah, maybe they just need a little coaching in that area too, because, yeah. you know, I'm all for, I'm not looking for the perfect person because they don't exist. You're yeah. looking for ones that are going to at least share these values, you know, and uh, we, we can, we can coach people. Yeah. I'd like to think. Great. That's awesome. So yeah. So vision, people, data, this one I love and coming from like an art background and I'm such a people person. It's just weird that I love data so much. And um, I like the data because I really truly believe it help. It, it removes feelings. Uh, we ran our business on feelings for such a long time. Feels like we're busy. Feels like people are happy. Feels like we're making money. Feels like we're not. You know, like it was all feelings until you start having data and what we call KPIs, key performance indicators. So you know, what data do you track? What's so important to you? Um, you know, we do the typical tracking in uh, leads that come in, conversion rates from leads to uh, CPEs, those comprehensive project evaluations we do. Um, but the, the majority, the, the really getting down deep for us is uh, gross profit per project, um, gross project per hour, watching hours on the job, you know, how many, because our hours aren't like 12 or 14, they're 300 or 400 hours on a project. And we always need to be looking at those things too. And, and you know, and certainly all of that uh, helps us have a better pulse on the company. It helps us to hold people accountable. And I think I've been lucky because even when I wasn't keeping a scorecard and I wasn't paying attention to the data, I was still making money. Yeah. It's just, if you just worked hard, you did the right thing and you estimated, um, I mean, that was just something that I, uh, I probably just had a feel for, but you can't run a, a bigger business like that. Um, but, but so now it's really looking at every job doing these autopsies on these projects. And there's a lot that goes, goes into that, but the findings are, so helpful and it allows us then with conviction to know hey this is the number that we need for this job take all the emotion out of it now you just got to go out and build some great value and hopefully uh you know and and, and get the work but yeah. it's important the the data is and that's you know in in all of our meetings uh on a, on a weekly basis to to monitor and see how we're doing yeah that's great and the data which is so there is there's forensic and historical data which in my opinion is is great, but it's also worthless. And that's kind of how Ken and I used to run our business was we actually kept good records and we had data, but we never read it and we didn't then take it to forecast. And I think you pretty much said it is you're, you're, you want to have certain gross profit on every job, but you need to know what the benchmark is. So is it 50%? Is it 40%? Is it 60%? Whatever it is, like the forensic data should help you understand what you, the goal is, and now you're setting it, hey, this job will be successful if we can finish it in 300 hours, if we mm -hmm. can, all of that, correct? Yeah, absolutely. And this, then you have your target, and then you're monitoring that target. Uh, you have buy-in, so every week, 
there's a broadcast, a group text that goes out to everybody in the field for every, so we're always working on five or six projects at one point. So everybody will see, hey, how's Shane doing on his job? Well, he's been allotted 380 hours and he's up to 290 so far. And as long as it's under, it's in green. Once it goes over and Happy the job's still going, it's in red. Yeah. So that creates probably some good competition too between crews and things too. You know, you're, 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 you're broadcasting that to the whole organization and that holds a certain level of, co- uh, of accountability for sure, but it also provides a healthy uh, a competitive environment too where people want to strive to do better. Yeah, absolutely. Because you're going you're to be right out there front and center. And, you know, hey, and I've coached people to say, you know, they'll be distraught when they go, one goes over. And it's like, you know, look, if we win nine out of 10 games, you know, in the NFL, if you're 13 and three, my gosh, isn't that a great season? Right? Yeah. You're going to the playoffs. And I always say, hey, we're just going to the playoffs. You know, and it's like you're not going to win every one, but let's take the ones where we did lose. Let's kind of understand. And it's not always a reflection of that lead on the job, too. That could have been uh, a client who was getting in your way of earning a reasonable income. It could also be the salesperson who didn't estimate it uh, accurately. So there's lots of things that can come in. Uh, come into play on that you just got you definitely got to coach through there but it does create the competition and can it also create some nice teamwork too yeah right and the data definitely drives this next part issues when you have data it's so easy to decide what part of your business you're going to look at you know i i'm i was joking i don't know if it was on a podcast or with somebody it's like how many times have we sat down for a meeting and then all of a sudden we realize the company christmas party's come in and we spend an hour talking about where we're eating and who we're inviting and meanwhile we didn't concentrate on any of what might be pressing and what's really cool is as we get into this next one so we talked about vision people data now we're going to talk about issues and this whole ids identify discuss and solve. And the data typically brings to light what probably one of the number one issues are in our business. So if the lead conversions down and we don't have enough leads to hit the goal, or if the gross profits off on the last three out of four jobs, that data feeds right into what we should be solving as a team. Correct? Right. Uh, uh, For sure. You know, and issues, I mean, I love that segment, you know, of any of our level 10 meetings and getting to that. And it's everybody giving their input and everybody's putting their perspective, you know, on this and to figure out what they are. Now, what I've learned, you know, the more you implement uh, traction, you know, as a concept and the entrepreneurial operating system, the more you do that, the less issues you're going to have. They're just not all of these issues. They almost seem nitpicky. They are. You know, so... You know, one of ours, like right now, I mean, there's just so few. When we get to this section, it's like you know, there might be two or three in there because everything else has been taken care of. It might be, hey, I think that there's an uptick in uh, trips to the lumber yard. And we know that we're inefficient. Why not have the lumber yards come out, you know, deliver to us? They're not going to charge us. Why would we ever go? So that's like a small little issue that we have right now. But these are like the extent of this stuff. If everything else is taken care of and you have your company-wide rocks, you have your leadership team rocks, you have uh, departmental rocks, everything's taken care of there. It's all off the table and it's nice and clean. So, uh, and issues become easier to, to solve if that's the case too, because uh, they can be exhausting if there's too many on there and it just means you're not doing things properly mm-hmm. at that point. Now, what would you, you know, for, for those that might not have read traction and understand some of the language in there, what's a big rock? What would be a rock? So a rock w- uh, would be like a, a, a 90 day um, obligation or uh, to do that, it's, that somebody would be doing. So it's a bigger issue. You know, it's the, the concept is moving the company ahead 90 days at a time. Um, so for us, you know, a rock, an example um, might be hiring uh, a new sales consultant within the next three months, or we wanted to uh, get Builder Trend implemented as a software platform, or hey, I wanted uh, everybody on the leadership team to do four videos in the next, you know, four months, which three months, which is a, would be an easy one. But uh, I love the the whole rock concept, you know, just giving responsibilities out, delegating to everybody. And you're being held accountable, too, because 
you're on a weekly basis, you might be talking about, hey, how's that rock going? You're not really going to discuss it, but we just want to know if it's on track. Yep. But then you are going to be held accountable to solve that within those 90 days. And if not, um, we want to know why. It might have to get assigned to somebody else, but we're going to deal with it. And it's just things then happen when you do that. Yeah. And what's so cool about when you identify an issue, it's not always, you know, um, recently we, we, we were looking at an issue in New York and it was, I don't think we're going to be able to hit August's goal with the current amount of people we have. And people seemed a little surprised. Um, but then when we went down to it, the issue was we just need another truck. We've got enough <laughs> yeah. people. We've got enough trained leaders. We might need one more person to step up a little bit more, but very solvable. But we, did, we saw it ahead of time. We come up, all right, we're buying a machine in a truck. No big deal. Issue solved. So it's really cool to kind of identify it. Sometimes it's not the issue is mm -hmm. what the issue is. So as you kind of dig deeper and deeper, you get there and then you solve it. And on a level 10 meeting, you typically have 60 minutes to solve problems if you're running it right. Like you said, in the beginning, you're going, all right, how are our leads? On track, off track, on track, boom, next item. Anytime something's off track, you don't pause. You don't say, oh, what's wrong with, why are we off on gross profit? What happened with the Miller job? You don't stop. You say, okay, we're going to discuss that. Yes. IDS it. And that was probably that. I mean, I'm probably jumping ahead, but my biggest takeaway in that entire book, because I feel like we had it surrounded. We were doing a lot of the stuff already was just that alone was how to run a management team meeting. There's a difference between uh, on the business meeting and in the business meeting. And when you're running a, 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 a management team meeting, you don't, you know, you run it completely different. Really enjoyed that part. Yeah, and I do like uh, just one more thing on issues where, you know, the book's definitely going to tell you maybe there are, a company does have seven or eight issues. Well, you're probably not going to be able to solve them all in that time. So, hey, let's prioritize. What are the top one or two or three? And that's what we're going to work on. Um, and, I, and I like that because this way you are kind of eating the frog, so to speak, you know, and taking care of the business that you really have to um, and not letting those things get away. So I think that's a good, um, good advice in the book. And what's cool. awesome about rocks is the more people that you have in, in your business and on these teams and these departments and stuff, it's the, the most awesome part is being able to see the progression of all these things being taken care of, being able to sit there, especially as the owner of a company and be able to say, look at all this stuff that's being accomplished and it I is. had nothing to do with it. I know. it. And that's it's, the yeah. awesome beauty of the whole, you know, and that's when you know that your business is really getting traction because you have buy-in from so many people in your company and all these things. Like when I go online or on Facebook or something, I see Mike Whalen putting up videos and he has his own group and you know, you know, you got all these guys doing all these things and you know, it's all happening, you know, and it's not always, you know, it's not the Brian show or the Ken and Ryan show. You know, you have people that, you know, you've created these opportunities for and they're moving a ton of rocks. And they are. Yeah. Rocks. And who would have thought that that would be possible and that can happen. I mean, it's just like, how did that happen? And it's really through implementing this stuff and having the, the great yeah. meetings and the, uh, the, the leadership of it. But it, it is a beautiful thing to see uh, for sure. Yeah. I think it all comes down to like uh, what one of our uh, mentors and coaches, uh, Kevin Nolan always says, share the insomnia. And it's not just <laughs> to get people worried. You know what? You stay up and worry about, you know, payroll this week. It's not about getting them to do that. But if they're sharing the insomnia of the vision, how are we going to in, in two years do this much revenue or have three more lead carpenters? They're sharing the insomnia. You're breaking it down into 90 day rocks and then boom, like everybody's chipping away at something that's going to make a difference. I, yeah. I love it. And, and all the problems, these aren't your problems, you know, as the owner of the company, they're everybody's problems. And that's what yeah. I love about even a leadership team. This is our problem. This is your problem here. And you're going to solve that. And I'm going to go solve these over here. So it's not like going back to when it's just one person at the helm who is when it's, you know, not in control, like we talked about earlier it's being able to just delegate all that and we uh, work together as a team. It's great. Awesome. So we've got vision, people, data, issues, and now we're going to talk a little bit about process. What are processes? Uh, well, you can talk to Bob about that. He would like give you a whole, a whole mouthful there. You know, I mean, he loves to write out. It's, you know, it's like the way, 
the DBS way. This is the way that we're going to manage an incoming lead. This is the way that we're going to, you know, now every time we sign a contract, everything is all, Ryan, you'd be proud. Everything is now goes, is scanned. We got this brand new wicked machine to do all this. So everything is not in this big fat folder anymore. And it's all bundled up in the computer and it's a process for it. And he's got binders to show step by step. This is how you do things, you know, and just having a, a process, whether it's a sales process um, or HR process, uh, how we close a project, how we analyze a project uh, post completion or even our customer service, you know, all the touches that we have, from the very first day all the way when the job is done and we're through warranty, what's the process of how we've made, you know, hopefully a raving fan through all of this. That's great. And what's crazy is everyone has a process, you know, it, it just might not be written and it might not be good. Like when I think of hiring, you know, it's not like you're hiring 50, 60 people a year and you've got this down pat, but once you start shining a light on things, you're like, Oh my gosh, my hiring process is terrible. <laughs> like wh what do they do? But then when you start to think of it as a process, it's like, all right, this is how we recruit. This is how we word our ads. This is how many interviews we do. When they first get hired, they're actually going to meet with Jen or Nadine or whoever first and go through the onboarding. Like when you start to think about it, everything has a process. When do I do their first review? How do I give feedback? So we do it for, for hiring. We do it for marketing. We do it for sales. Uh, what's great about developing processes is now multiple people get to own it and they have a roadmap. They got the playbook. Now you're in charge of hiring. Oh, yeah. what do I do? Here's the playbook. Enjoy. You know, it was awesome. We did a field ops call uh, about a week ago, and one of our franchisees, Luke Smith in Columbus, Georgia, he held up one of our, our manuals, and we were talking about interviewing. And he says, this is what I do. This is the playbook right here. Ken and Ryan wrote it. Here's all the questions. <laughs> a lot of people out there have a really hard time with this whole recruiting, and I can't find good people or whatever. But, you know, the reason why – we can't, and I know this firsthand because I've lived through it, is that I didn't have a good process for it. I didn't know how to ask good questions in an interview, you know? I wasn't even a good interview myself before I started this business, you know? It was hard enough to get a teaching <laughs> job because I didn't know how to interview. You know, none of this stuff is, is taught uh, to a lot of people, but you know what? what? What Traction does and what this book does is, and what many other books do is, is it helps us to be able to learn how to do these things. And if we don't, and we don't come up with processes for all these different things, it, business can be really tough. Sure. Yeah. Think, think of how, how much easier it is to train also if everything's written down, everything is a process. And somebody new comes into the company and they're like, well, how, how, I don't know, how do I answer the phone? What are the questions that we ask? You know, how are we even lead qualifying and going through all this? And if it's all there and this is our agreed upon process, it's going to be very easy to train on it. And I also then think it's very easy to make subtle changes as we grow, you know, to manipulate and change little things the more you look at it. So, uh, yeah, it's definitely we need, need processes. Like you I agree, Ryan, everybody's got them. They might not like them. They might not be written down, but you can really, uh, if you want to scale, you really have to have these processes identified and uh, written down and in place. Yeah. And one of the most impressive things I think you've done in your business lately was having somebody in sales and being successful that never sold remodeling or necessarily was a carpenter or lead carpenter. You know, you've got Michelle who came from a construction background with pools and sales and, and landscaping and things successfully selling remodeling, which for all intents and purposes, I would think you need to have done it for 20, 30 years so that you can know and see the ins and outs. But because of your processes, you literally gave someone a playbook and they're successful in selling for modeling. It's insane. And not grinding on your crews going, what the heck is she doing? She doesn't know anything. You're not getting that. Yeah. Well, I, uh, first she's a special individual and she's a terrific sure. stu student uh, to work with, but there is a process to go into somebody's home. There's a process to developing a job scope um, that is, that's teachable. Uh, we teach it, you know, I'll be teaching in uh, October at the convention, uh, a class on job scoping. There's a process for our estimating, which I think is very simple and it's easy to follow along with that job scope. And then a process on delivering that scope and, and asking, uh, you know, a prospect for their business too. So yeah, it certainly makes it easier than now. Just think of how many more people 
that that, that job might be attractive to and yeah. somebody that you can get, you know, on board and be successful a lot easier if you have these processes in place. Oh, for sure. Once the process is built and done, you know, the heavy lifting is done of that. Yeah, there's some tweaks that you do along the way. Yeah, yeah, there's some tweaking that we do to change it up. But once you have that thing in place, it may, like you just said, it makes it so much easier to train somebody to get somebody in there and up to speed a lot quicker. You know, in the industry, and in, in, you probably hear this in remodeling too. It's like, yeah, I just hired this new guy, but you know, it's going to take me at least a year or two years to get him to be from an apprentice to be, you know, you know, like a kid out of high school or out of BOCES program to get him up to speed. But if you had some kind of process that you could teach them, and you know, that's kind of our job too, attraction, especially in the construction industry we are the educators. And if we're not giving them these manuals and these things, uh, it's going to take way longer for them to be successful. And I think a lot of reason why guys don't grow in our industry is because they get so burnt out uh, because they, they don't have a process. And, and, and then if you don't have a process, your failure rate is so much higher. And so is your turnover and everything else that happens to you in business that could be negative. Sure. And again, most carpenters didn't think for them to be successful. They didn't dream that they would be writing up processes for people to follow. <laughs> you know, it was, it was all about doing the, uh, you know, the, the miter joint on the crown, beautiful, or being able to figure out a complex roof, you know, things like that, and didn't really sign up for those things. But these things are so vital, so important to our success, for it's sure. It's so true, too, because I'm in a gutter installer forum on Facebook. <laughs> and I'll tell you, at least every week, once a week, these guys are going back and forth about hand tabbing miters or using strip miters or box miters. And I'm like, who cares? They all three work. That's right. You know? they I all know three it. Work, but, you know, that's not going to get your business to the next level. <laughs> yes. It, yeah, it's crazy. No, so it's not. We discussed vision, people, data, issues, process. And this is all leading us to the big title of the book. This is where we actually get track, traction because gaining traction actually requires action and execution of your ideas and the things. And I believe that's where we see most people fail. It's not a matter of, you know, um, knowing, it's doing. Yeah. And it's really, it's uh, now it's time to execute, right? So we have these, uh, uh, these five other components that we just discussed. And now you got to be willing to put these, you know, to, to get down to it, execute this, roll up your sleeves. You know, and it, I think it's challenging for some. First of all, you have to carve out a uh, tremendous amount of time you know, yeah. to do it. But the time, that's what's going to make you the money where most people are thinking, no, if I'm going and hanging gutters or if I'm out in the field working, that's where I'm going to make money. But we know, we've learned, that's not where you make your money. Right. Our money is in our processes. Our money is in coaching, in training, in thoughtfulness, in customer service, all these other things that you wouldn't even imagine that that's where the money is coming from. Um, so it's tough to get some people to do it, but it's really, it's time to, you know, uh, dish out some major accountability with a disciplined approach, you know, what and that's you for somebody that's, uh, you know, it's, it's been struggling. Somebody that's, it's, it's at maybe one crew, it's them. And they have this one guy that they wish they could clone or maybe they don't. And they wish they could clone themselves and they're not, they're not getting traction. Um, they have a, they have maybe a vision of where they picture their business to want to go, but how do I get that vision implemented? Uh, you know, it, it talks about in the book, you know, you're hiring the right people for the right jobs. It's talking about organizing your systems and process, but what comes first, if, you know, what's putting the cart before the horse or the horse before the cart. You know, if I know where I want to get to, but I'm not getting there, what would you recommend would be the first thing that they need to start on uh, first? Well, uh, you, so you can just ask me, hey, what got you going? How did you, how were you able to gain any traction? And uh, I think it was the hiring of Bob, you know, somebody who could help me to work on the business instead of just in the business, because there's no money to be made, you know, just working in the business all the time. It's not going to get us anywhere. It's just a job. You might as well go work for somebody else. So we got to be able to carve out that time or have somebody else come in. And, and that's where I think we started to gain it was when Bob came in uh, to the company. And, and furthermore, you know, now for us to try to go to the next step. So the next step is to really get this company so that it's really not reliant on me at all. 
And that's the bridge that we were at when I talked to you about um, Shane, you know, concerned with, hey, I'm going to outlast you. So the next thing that I had to do was say, okay, you know what? I can't burn Bob out and Bob's working really hard. I need to get it. And he's our operations manager. I think we need an operations support manager so that if I'm not here, there's someone else that's going to be able to help him and be really, really good. You know, and I picked somebody who I think is uh, super qualified at systems, at processes and about accountability because he has experience with all of that. Mm. Um, so, it's a, that's a tough question though, Ken, you know, where do I start? What's the first thing that I do? What's the, the most important thing? But I think it's probably a hire of somebody who can help us with, with behind the scenes stuff. And it could be things that maybe that person's not good at or interested in doing. Hmm. Somebody's got to be at that helm. And there's a lot of people out there, I'm sure that are unsure of, you know, do I hire this guy and take this, you know, the blind faith step in hiring somebody like a Bob, or do I need to get my processes and systems, or is it something that happens, uh, you know, uh, together? Uh, and and maybe you could maybe touch on, you know, the importance of if maybe if you could go back and do it all over again, even though we're you're super successful, you know, if you could uh, shorten the gap from where you started to where you are now, is there something that you would do differently? maybe with getting a coach or something that could have maybe shortcutted the amount of time to where you are now from where you were when you, when you started down the path of growing your business. Yeah. And you, you, you hit it right there. It, it would have been to get a coach, you know, and I try to uh, encourage people who want me to mentor them, you know, um, and I do some consulting in our industry. And especially if you go and speak at conventions, people are always, you know, asking you, hey, do you do some consulting? And, and I do, I love to do it. I just don't have a ton of time to do it right now. But I'm just so convinced. It's like, boy, this would be, and I don't even want to sell them on the idea that this is a great idea, but I believe in it. You could either do it the way I did it, or we could take 15 years off, 20 years off. If you just go to somebody who's already done it, they've already conquered that. It's not rocket science. It just takes time. Uh, have a coach to be able to help you with it. I think that is the, uh, you know, the, the, the best advice that I would give somebody if they want to trim, trim the years off for sure, you know, and just continuing to think uh, or be aware, be cognizant that working on the business is just as important as working in the business. And that's hard for some people to do, especially with their workload and they're out there working with their hands. They can't see that far ahead. Yep. So in order to get traction in our business, not only do we have to hold our people to a certain level of accountability, but we need to hold ourselves as individuals to making ourselves uh, get, get, become a better version of ourselves so what we, can, we can also have traction uh, personally because that's really going to dictate a lot of the success that we have as well. <clears throat> yeah, for sure. And, you know, just going even back to our core values, I feel it's my obligation as the steward of this company that I need to exemplify every one of those. I need to bring those to the table every day. Every job site that I visit, it's got to be on my mind. But you know what? I think that's what works with this company. They trust me. They know, hey, BA is working. I'm doing my stuff. Uh, behind the scenes. I'm working, you know, through the pandemic. Uh, I never let up. I was here every day doing what I had to do and I'm doing it for them. I'm doing it for the company and I'm just, I'm fulfilling my obligation, make sure that, you know, I'm uh, part of all these core values as well. That's great. Ken, to kind of go back to that question a little bit. Um, I, I, a lot of people are always wanting to get their company perfect before they hire some of these key people. They're like, Oh, it's such a mess. I don't want to hire somebody or I'm still coming. I'm still working out of my house. Um, but everything I've heard today and just thinking of nobody ever regrets the money they spent on a person and we need that person to get it where we want, because we've said it before. If your vision can be accomplished by you alone, it's not big enough. Our vision has to be big enough that we need others to help accomplish it. So yes, you need to hire that person to help your systems. Yes. You need to hire that person to get your accounting in order, whatever you're trying to make perfect before you get that person, you're wasting your time get the person to help you get, get it and there. Done is better than what Ryan? I don't know what you're talking about, but <laughs> done is better than perfect. I know big brother. Um, but yeah, so if you have a vision, then the people are next, you know, data's third on this list because you need the people to get to these other places to implement, to, to share the big rocks and all of that stuff. So yeah. Yeah. So, and then uh, Ryan taking some of that, 
money early on back to you know that question ken you know what would i do maybe a little bit differently i would have done a little bit more of saving my money so that i could quickly reinvest it back into the business um, because the 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 uh, individual who's always skimming the company because they want to go on vacation or they want a better car or a better house you're going to find it very difficult to make that business grow because it it does need some money invested into it in that in those people for sure and in in other things maybe the service that you deliver the value that you offer so that would be another big one for me as far as uh, advice i would give yeah i agree i've seen it time and time again guys that can't afford to hire the right people yet their salaries are tremendous and it's because they've <laughs> they've taken so much from their business and now they can't afford to change their lifestyle because they're living at that dollar amount um, yeah. so yeah, there's a time for that. And that's, I think why we all start a business is to have all that, but I feel all like if you topic, sacrifice right? huh? business and personal, all, all, uh, are interwoven. Well, yeah, the more you sacrifice up front, the quicker you get to the other side of what your vision is. You know, you want to take every dollar out of your business. You might feel you're entitled to it, but you're going to have a, a, a small business. Yeah. And it is, it's a sacrifice. Yeah. It really, it really is. And that's tough for people and a lot, you know, want the immediate gratification and Hey, I'm in business. Oh, and I'm making money. Well, it's really not that way. You know um, I don't know if it's the way that I did it, you know, go and work to 70 to 80 hours a week. You know, that was my way of surviving over that hump where most people are just going to fall off because the wheels just start to come apart. And at least I was lucky enough to have the grit to get beyond those days. But, uh, it's tough. You know, it's not for the faint of heart, uh, no. uh, running, a, running a small business for sure, no. but it uh, can be a beautiful thing too. And the best job ever created in this, um, in America. Excellent. Yeah. I agree. So let's take the book traction. We kind of discussed all the big points. Um, what was kind of your biggest uh, takeaway or it's all about action. So you read this book. <clears throat> what was the biggest thing that you implemented or took action on? Um, well, I think one of the things that I learned, you know, was uh, vision without traction is a hallucination. It's <laughs> great. I mean, Love it's that. really, it's not going to happen, right? If we don't have the vision traction organizer, which is a tool, you know, of um, everything that we just discussed. So you can see that, you can see this dashboard. So that was very helpful. So I, I think the, uh, that VTO was super critical the whole concept of rocks to move our company 90 days at a time, as we talked about, um, was huge for me. But I think really the, the biggest, my biggest takeaway was the development of the leadership team. So we have six uh, individuals on that team and uh, um, they are just incredible at what they do and they've really made it so that I can live my, I can be free to be who I am in this company, which is I'm the, I'm the motivator, I'm the leader of this company and the visionary of this company. And I can do all those things because I have different people that are being accountable for all the other things we have to take care of, any problems that we face, anything that we're trying to conquer. Um, so the leadership team was huge. You know, I mean, you really can just go go on. I'm a, I'm a better business person, I think, because of it. I'm uh, more accountable, but I'm more responsible. I'm a better teacher. That's awesome. Great. Yeah. My biggest thing, because I, I don't know how, but before even reading the book, I think be, because of our coaching and stuff, we were doing so much of it. My biggest thing was, again, the leadership team, the level 10 meeting. And what's funny is I'm going to tell you, I cheated in the beginning. I went and watched a seven or eight minute video on YouTube on how to run a level 10 meeting. And I literally started doing it before I even read the book. <laughs> and then, you know, then you read it and you kind of get Why did you give that to me? I could have done the same thing. I wouldn't have had to read it. <laughs> well, I figured, you, you know, I didn't want to shortcut you too much. Footnotes. Yeah. But um, yeah, so go look for, you don't have to read Traction, just go look for a seven minute video on YouTube on a level 10 meeting, it'll be great. No, read that book three times and then pick it up and read it again. Because uh, I, I tell you, every time, you know, if I read it, there's so many things going through your head so you miss stuff and you go back and I was like, oh my gosh. So it, this last time that I uh, read it, you know, I picked up on the uh, people analyzer. And that really helped me because I've already had discussions with a couple of employees saying, look, we need to be able to check every box here. So every time you go back and read it, there's a, another little nugget in there. So I think it's awesome. 
Now, would you have your yes, team sir. read it or did you have your team read I, it? I did. Our leadership team had to read it. Yeah, for okay. sure. And then I have uh, somebody else who just asked me for it. And, oh, boy, don't you love that? Oh. Somebody who's just inspired and you didn't even have to initiate that. And they're like, hey, you mind? Uh, you got a copy of Traction I can read? And I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is awesome. All the greatest yeah. books that I've ever read have that same quality is that every time you go back and read through it again, you learn something new out of it. Because like you said, which was really super important that, you know, there's only certain things that we can see uh, and that we can digest. But then when you go back around uh, to these great books like this one, Traction, um, you always pick out a new nugget, uh, you know. Yeah. So and it's, that's, that's, uh, that's a great point. It's a very, uh, it's a technical book too. You know, it's not just like a super easy read. You got to be thinking about all these different things that are in there. But I, I like that aspect of it. And it is, it's, it's a very good roadmap. And I love that it's actionable. I, I get, I hate yeah. books that are all in your brain and hey, you need systems. It's like, okay, great. How do I do it? Like, I love that they give you the roadmap. They give you the forms. You can download the PDFs on how to do a level 10 meeting. It's, it's fantastic in that sense. Tough question I had answering for myself. I'm curious what you think. Who, at what level do you recommend this book to somebody? Like, who would you recommend this to? I, I, I mean, we're talking about trades and a lot of trades people are on here, but anybody who has a business or whatever. I think anybody that has um, maybe two or three employees working for them. Um, you know, if you're out there on your own, I, don't, I guess you could read it to get you poised for your next step. But I really think that it's so universal and there are small things to get. Like even, for example, that people analyzer or, or creating what your, your core values are, that's just going to help you with hiring. It's going to help you with firing, stuff like that. So I think it's, uh, it's the broad spectrum. I think just about anybody could, could ab ab absolutely uh, have some great takeaways from the book. Yeah. I was leaning a little bit to the same because as we, you know, onboard franchisees, we're always trying to pick like the perfect book for them to, to read before they, you know, do all this. And I'm like, you know what, if you don't have employees or you don't, you've never had a management team, like there's sometimes you read books and you're just not ready for it. And um, I, I was thinking a little bit of the same. You kind of had to, got to be in the game a little bit for this to really jump out and inspire you. But I could be wrong. I don't know if anyone, you know, give us feedback if you've read it before you did any of it. And it was, because it is the roadmap. I believe it is a perfect day one book if you intend on having yeah. a business with some scale. It's just a matter of where's your brain when you read it. Yeah, you just got to be ready for it. But yeah, I think at all levels, uh, I think it's an exceptional book. And you really, you don't need another platform. I mean, there is your operating platform and you could just follow that uh, right to the T. And I think that anybody would do great with that. Awesome. I agree. All right. So, man, I know we've got pretty deep on this and I think we're at a, a decent length in this podcast, but I really, you know, the part I was really looking forward to, you know, cause having Brian on for the first time after 17 episodes, you know, <laughs> definitely wanna, you know, because our, our, our work, our business and professional lives, they, they mix, you know, and over the years we've become great friends going up to your, your cabin and snowmobiling and know your family, um, go out to lunch and, and to conferences. I mean, it's, uh, I would love to just kind of talk a little bit about, about that. Yeah, well, it's, um, I mean, it's just been a great run. And, I, you know, what do we do? We, we go to these conventions, we go on these trips, and it's always the same thing. We get in the darn car and, you know, within five miles, like you've already gotten your first business nugget. You know, True. and we've been, we've driven down to Baltimore and you get halfway there and we're like, dude, we could turn around right now. We've already got the nuggets. You know, <laughs> we don't even need to go to the convention. We've got enough True. right now to uh, last us, you know, so long. So it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's been uh, just a, a great run. And uh, the, the relationship is, it's, it's so inspiring first, but uh, you know, I mean, I, it's, it's been, uh, it's great. Yeah, it is cool. I remember one of the first like things that I, I remember asking you to just repeat. It was like on customer service, you just, your language of customer service and how you talk to a client um, is so second nature to you that I remember like you were just talking about, yeah, you know, I just ask them, um, 
you know, just thank them for the opportunity to, to do their remodel. I'm like, wait, wait, thank you for the opportunity. I'm like literally writing down things that you wouldn't even picture and appreciate it. Just appreciate the opportunity to do your remodel. I'm like, Oh my gosh, wait, say that again. Like, just and, the wording, the language. Privilege. Don't forget the, privilege. Privilege. Pri- privilege was, I had to, I, I still don't know how to spell <laughs> the word, but yeah, right. you know, every time it underlines it in red, I'll get it right someday. But the, using that, that language was probably, that was so early in our relationship. And I just remember like loving hearing it come out of your mouth and writing it down and eventually adapting that to what we do. Uh, yeah, and Ryan, I'll, I'll tell you, that is, I was talking to my father-in-law about this last night because people weren't calling him back for, I don't know, he was looking for a plumber and he was just frustrated. And and then I had a tree guy come over and do some work uh, a couple of days ago too. And it was funny, we were sitting out there and I'm like, huh, I said, that guy never thanked me for my business when he left. And it's like, just think of that, that little small thing that's free right? Hey, I just wanted to thank you so much for the opportunity to come out here to take care of all your needs with the, uh, with the trees. I think your house looks great now. There's a lot more light coming in. I hope you guys really enjoy it. You have a beautiful home here. Uh, thanks for the drinks that you, you gave me and the use of your bathroom and, and all of that. Just imagine if he said that, would you be slightly inspired to hire that person again? Or would you be more poised to do a review for that person? Or would you ever think to bring that conversation up at the dinner table to share with your friends true and and it's so these are these subtle things and i I guess i I would say you know i don't i don't know everything by any stretch there's a few things that i think that i um have a really good handle on and and that have led me to where i am in business and one of those is the gift of just the appreciation that thoughtfulness, and that is, doesn't, you know, just happen to be one of our core values, to appreciate the people that we get to serve and to uh, go out of our way for them. You go to somebody's house, um, or they call, I was here Saturday, somebody calls me on a Saturday, I'm like, first, you know what, I just want to say thank you so much for having a look at DBS. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you right now. Hey, what's going on? What's on your mind? And they were like, so taken aback by that. But why wouldn't we do that? And, you know, here's the secret, you know, that uh, we know, you and I know, it's where the money is. Yeah. It is. It's where yeah. the money is. But everybody's like, oh, I don't need to do that. I just, I did a beautiful job out there. That's not important. No, that is what's important. How about finding out? My work speaks out? for itself. Well, yeah. you know, you're just a master at treating people like people and not like objects. You know, and that's really what it comes down to. A lot of people are in this mentality, especially in construction, where, like you just said, if I go out and just do a good job and my miters look great and whatever, um, you know, they should be so happy with that. But that's not really, you're missing the whole point. The whole point is people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And you're the master at it. You're the master at making people feel good because not only do you do it, but because there's money involved in it, but you genuinely do it because that's who you are. Um, and your mom taught you well, like you said earlier, you know, she did. And, that, and that comes through, man, when that comes through, that really touches people. Not, you know, that's where you get that whole trust factor that you have as one of your core values is because you genuinely do appreciate and, and genuinely think and believe. And not only that, you cast that vision into your employees of the whole privilege. This is a privilege that I'm getting to work in somebody's home. I'm earning a living from this. And you know, this, this is how I provide for my family and to make it a big deal to that person that's hiring us or those workers that are working on their home and being able to do that. I mean, and that's the sequel. That's the sequel to the next podcast is great customer service. Because oh, you're the master at it. All right. Yeah, that would be good. You know, and I'll tell you, uh, I don't know if I'm a master at it or not, but I think I'm a pretty good coach at it because so we've had this success because everybody in this company buys into that and they do it, you know, and that's, what's like magical. That's, what's beautiful. If I'm at a pre-construction meeting, you know, where we're there about three weeks ahead of time, learning how to be a good guest in their home in three weeks when we're going to be there to start this job. And I just love hearing our lead carpenter. First thing they're doing, Hey, I just want to first thank you so much for the opportunity for choosing DBS to come to your home. It's going to be a privilege for me to be here. And then they're going through and, you know, uh, Pete will take his glasses off and he's like, you know, I I just want to know 
what's weighing on your mind most right now? We're going to start this project in three weeks. I'm sure there's a lot of anxiety. We're going to be, you know, uprooting you from your kitchen. We're going to blast, you know, take the whole thing apart and redo it. You know, what's giving you some anxiety? And people love to hear that. And they love to know that people care about that. And in our business, that's what's missing. It's what's absent is that care of their home and being in tune with all the things that they might be fearful of on struggling. And if you can overcome them for them, if you can provide a solution for them, then they'll be great clients to work with. But how do we know those things? You ask, you know, even in the intro, uh, first time there, hey, could you just share with me, what kind of qualities are you looking for in a contractor? You know, because that's important to me. I'd just like to know what is important to you? What are you looking for? And they appreciate the question. So. Oh, it's incredible. And that's what I wrote, you know, some of the things that I've learned from you. I mean, there's been so much, like you said, we hop in the car, we go on a trip, just the back and forth. And it it literally is just talking about, oh yeah, so I was doing this the other day. Wait, what do you mean you're doing that? What, what, how are you doing that? I want to do that. Like that's typically, you know, how it goes, but your, your professionalism, the customer service, and I wrote the language of appreciation. Mm. All that stuff that you just said took me like a while just hearing it over and over because it comes out of you so naturally to then train our team on it, you know, put it into our process, thank the client for the opportunity. And like that's, that's in our process now because of you. How cool yeah. is that? That's the cool. Why people respond to it so incredibly is because it's a huge differentiator of from what we see out there in the country today. And Amen. That's going on. You're right, Ken. Everything that's going on is, you know, people don't have a light language of appreciation for people. And we need more of that because, you know, evidently it's, it's something that is missing in our society. And it is so absent. I mean, just go to a restaurant, right? And they're like, hey, how you doing? You know, okay, what can I get you? It's like, hold on a second. First of all, I, I don't know if you're aware, but there were a hundred restaurants within a five mile radius that I could have chose. I chose yours. So how about, hey, how you doing? Thank you so much for choosing our place and for coming in. How's the temperature here? How's going on? You know, let me share with you some good stuff. When you're done, did you enjoy everything? Was there any part of the experience we could have done better? And that's where, you know, uh, again, we've talked so much about feedback, you know, getting that feedback. And a lot of people are not, (laughs) they're afraid to get the feedback. They don't want to hear anything negative. But you don't need, you know, we talked earlier that we, uh, we need a coach. We have coaches. It's every client that we serve. And couldn't we ask them on the way out the door, hey, uh, could you share with me, only because I want to build a better business, could you share with me maybe three things that we could have done a better job with while we were here at your home? And and while we're at it, and I tell them I'm not looking for a pat on the back, but also could you share with me three things that you really, really enjoyed? And if we listen to that, if we document it and we share it with our team, I don't know. Maybe we don't need a coach. That's who you need to just share with you. Here's all I've learned because we do all that. And even in the front end, tell me what kind of contractor you're looking for. And even when we sign a contract, why did you hire me? I would love to know three reasons. You get the answers to all of that. There's the secret sauce. Do all of these things and stay away from all the things that they said you could have done a better job with. And And those two minutes, if somebody who owned a restaurant listened to that, they have everything they need to coach their people into being the busiest restaurant around. Just appreciate the people choosing you sincerely with all the choices they had right? and find out what you could do better and then go do it. It's as simple and hard as that. There are, and there are examples of that. You know, there are, I mean, you go into Chick-fil-A for instance, you know, it's fast food, you know, but the difference is, is when you go in there is how the, the, the people that are employed there treat you because they have awesome training. Um, and that's, that's something that, you know, we can all be, we can be all be awesome at, we can be awesome at training and training our people to, 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 uh, exemplify those core values. Yeah, for sure. And that was, uh, so our, uh, operations support manager that I hired that I had mentioned to help out with Bob, he was, uh, uh, the GM of a local franchise, very successful, uh, big food chain. Uh, not not fast food, but uh, uh, dine-in food. And he he had some awesome training coming to here. I mean, he's just an awesome person to begin with, but he had some great training too. And it was like just, and he, he got it right away. And he mm-hmm. knew, because when I interviewed him, one of the first things he said is uh, that we have guests 
come into our establishment. Uh, oh, my, and it like tickled my ear. I was like, oh my gosh, what? You know, and it was just, spot. he said that. Just, Coach you're, you're hired. You're hired. Yeah, so it was awesome. Um, before we go, I want, I want to go back to sure. um, how important the book was to our business growth. Okay. I just want to, I want to uh, answer that. And I, it, it's, I think it's pretty profound too. So I read the book the first time, probably the tail end of 2018. And I reread it again in the beginning of 2019. It was 2009, in the beginning of that year, maybe the end of 2018, we started our leadership team and kicked it off. And then we were in full gear all the way through. 2019 was by far, by far, our most profitable year ever. And it was, that was not a coincidence. Brian, appreciate having you. Appreciate everything that you've uh, done to us, been for us in, uh, in, uh, in this journey here. It's been amazing. It really has. And it's uh, the same. I, I don't think we would be uh, quite where we are if it wouldn't be for the brothers. And then personally, I wouldn't be quite where I am as a human being if it wasn't for the brothers. Yeah. Love uh, you guys. All right. Love you love too, you, man. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. And we hope you implement at least one or two nuggets from this episode that will give you the confidence to grow. Subscribe to our podcast to stay updated and grow with the bros.